for the 
nation that we have lost. Think, take some efforts to how do we re reconquire the space, not being emotional, not being emotional, we need emotions, and not being emotional, but take some political understanding of how do we become free and as a nation. So how do we, then we begin to understand the question of that resistance, the defiance. Resistance and defiance, but you ask a question, I'm not in Tibet, I'm staying in India. I'm staying so far away from my homeland, but how can I resist? But you can resist the policies. You can resist the oppression. And you can share that message. Then about like you create a collective consciousness, create a collective opinion, and generate a public opinion in the world, then we keep moving and fighting the Chinese, the, the occupiers in so many different ways. So there are, to be there is a great blessing. And to be not there is not about like, you know, it's, it's a misfortune. That is all. It's a misfortune. You can turn the pages of life. You can turn the pages of life, but how can the pages of life turn with the wind turn the pages of history? Not at all. Wind only blows the pages of history away. If you think someone else will kind of like, you know, turn the pages, will read history for us, will read about political future for us, means like, you know, we'll be blown away. What is being blown away is that being blown away by time, being blown away by the forces which are of greater strength than us, then we become helpless. We should not become helpless. We should be prepared. We should understand about like, you know, there is no civilization in this world that has been eternally just kept under oppression, eternally thrown away in subjugation. And then there are so many historical narratives in the world which the community should read, should understand, should respond to it and say that we are also the same people who can fight. And who can move, but then the fighting is not by saying, okay, my friend will go to fight and I cannot, uh, I have something else to do. You cannot fight like that. But fighting is not that everybody has to do the same thing and everybody has to do the political work. But you do what is good for you, what is important for you to do it. But keep your nation in your consciousness. Keep your nation in your consciousness. And then, when in this consciousness, then I want to narrate another incident about it. This second incident, we were very deeply involved for three years. We went to so many settlements. We spoke to people. We kind of did, did the readings from Gandhi, Sin Swaraj, and then talk to them about like, the necessity of remembering your nation. This is the necessity of like, you know, someday, sometimes, and I will go back to my country. But to the, asking people here to go back to your country is not my purpose. I want to tell you this. If I, if I, that's the, the if I, if I sometimes I used to, I'm saying this in my personal sharing, and I used to wonder about, so suddenly the river becomes free, and then about like sooner, and I think how many beautiful people, wonderful people, my teachers, my students, my friends, and the community that I have interacted, I used to think, oh my God, they will all be gone to another country. But at another level, I think I'll feel, oh, if they go there, at least they go to the country, and I can see them in their homeland. So we are not sad about if you have to have a nation. That is very, very important for us. And this consciousness is like, you know, in this world, that everyone is a refugee. Is there anyone who is not a refugee in this world? We come here, we are born, we come into this country, and, but we have certain kind of consciousness, which differentiates us from one country, one culture, but interrelatedness of culture and consciousness and sharing the spirit, sharing the journey and many things we share like this as Tibetans and as Indians and as people of different countries, different religions, 
And in all this we experience this. But practically, not all of us just pass by. All of us pass by as part of the humanity. Now in this search that we need to have a greater consciousness as humanity, we also need to have what they call the identity, the consciousness, then the responsibilities towards our own people. But when we say towards our own people is that, that the liberation, the liberation is not a political word, I want you to know this. And when I stand before you and say that, like, you know, liberate your country means I'm not asking you to become rebellion. But this liberation is that, liberate the human beings from the clutches of oppression. Let that identity be the nation. Let that identity be the another consciousness, another level. These are all consciousness, nation, and then the culture, and then about like you know, certain common binding values. And the transcending value, binding values are not simply close, but transcending values and transcending consciousness. Then, in 1959 and uh, 60, as the time that uh, his Holiness arrives in India and settles down and uh, in Shogi and subsequently later goes to uh, Dharamsala during this, in between this period a Nehru government, the first Prime Minister Nehru, uh, his government gave an offer to His Holiness and his future government in exile. They said like, you know, uh, two things we can offer. One is that like, we are willing to offer that all your children, the Tibetan children, can join the Indian schools, study and become, join the Indian schools and they are absolutely welcome. They can be enrolled in the Indian schools and study. So education is a great privilege, I want to tell you that. And I'll give you some case studies of that. If anybody given that offer, and I will just say like, please, I'm more than grateful to you. I'm more than giving me a fool if you give me an opportunity to educate myself. And, and that will be a greatest gift, greatest pride. And uh, you know what is only the Dalai Lama said at the time? I'm humbly grateful for this offer that our children can go to Indian schools. But I will be more than grateful if you allow us to open our schools of our own. You see the difference between the ordinary and then the enlightened. And his holiness Dalai Lama is a universal soul, is a universal being. He does not think like, you know, the only Tibetans should be better in this world. He thinks about, truly he thinks about every being in this world should be blessed and be happy. He blesses everyone. And, but there he differentiates that these people have lost the land. They are in an occupation. They are, they are not to be occupied. And if they have to kind of like, you know, uh, the importance, the blessing of edu education is a great blessing. But much more than education is that they must evolve with the consciousness of a lost nation. Then but how will the lost nation will come with the uh, memory of this lost nation, the responsibilities of the culture and civilization that has been stand, oppressed, and must be fought, must, must find a realm for struggling and survival is that, he said, give us an opportunity to educate our children in our educational system. So that is how the TCB, the Tibetan schools have come into origin. This is a truly a unique experiment in all refugee communities throughout the world. It's a forerunner. And like, you know, why do you have to remember that? When you say, okay, I am a doctor, I am an engineer, I am a scientist, and then about like, you know, I am a great scholar, I am an English literature professor, I am a physics professor, but when you become all this as a Tibetan, why did His Holiness wanted about the Tibetan schools and Tibetan education is that 
He wanted you to remember in everything you becoming. He wanted you to remember that you are Tibetan. Otherwise, you would have gone into Indian schools in 1960, and then you, you would have, like many other refugee communities in India, and they gone into the different schools, and they all have just gone in different directions. You can never find, find the kind of like the the bond and growing together, studying together, evolving together, and then experiencing this whole Tibetan identity. Now, there is something else also. From here, we, the Tibetan community, somewhere by, it stopped by the 1990s and 2000s. When it stopped is that, it just failed to reinvent, recall, and then keep this imagination, keep this dream, of a nation that you have to fight And we became very comfortable. Comfortable in the sense like, I won't use the word comfortable in a, what you call as luxury. I don't, I don't mean that word comfortable as luxury. I use the word comfort in the sense like, you know, indifferent. And what is that like, you know, uh, another uh, situation. If you remember the first generation of the Tibetan parents and grandparents, most of you, your age, may have grandparents also living in India as who came as well in the 1950s. If you go back to see their struggle, then about the sacrifices they have done, then the, when you see the map of India, the border roads that you see, the border, large section of the border roads was laid by the Tibetan elders. When they came, they, they worked on the border roads and about like they worked on the most difficult work. Like you know, in, in those areas, you wear a kind of a, either a snow boot or you wear a long rubber shoes and then the work about the stones and moving the big stones, working on the thing. And the reason is that, like you know, the livelihood must be earned. Then by the 1970s, the identity is that, like you know, it's very easy to say about like you know, people, you identify Tibetan most of them. Oh, the sweater, people who sell sweater. But this is the way the community struggle. There's nothing wrong. All professions are the, the professions for livelihood. The divine, the, like you know, it's an honorable profession. There's nothing dishonorable. We all come from a very humble family. We all come from a very humble background. But the Tibetans are the struggle. I don't want you to forget that struggle of your, the father and folk, the grandfathers that in this country, the grandmothers, the mothers who struggled in all this way, who laid the roads, who carried huge volume of material on their back to one city to another city to feed the families. And why I'm telling you this story is that in 2008 and 9, and one of the most beautiful things happened in the CBS, CBS results when they published CBS results, the national talkers were Tibetan school. You know the percentage of the Tibetan school talkers is that they passed about like you know 97.4 percent for the Tibetan school performance. Then. Or it's completely as big as the Indian schools. And why I tell you is that I went to different places and I said, this is what you call as the community's determination. The community's determination to struggle and to perform and to do this, like you know, where from people from 1950s and 60s who laid the roads in, in the border roads of India and to the same children, the grandchildren are the top performers in this country in the CBSC board. And like you know, so when you see this whole transition is that the Tibetan community has undergone remarkable transformation, remarkable changes in the start. And therefore, like you know, in my example of my PhD students is that I get to a professor in the university can guide in Madras University. You can guide about maximum 10 PhD. In a sense, at any time, 10, only 10 PhD students can be guided by us. If, if you are a 
guiding for 10 years or maximum you can get about like uh, 3 PhDs can get. Out of the 10 PhDs, the 4 are therapy as well. The 4 students are, when I, I, I only ask, if you are therapy and you want to do PhD, that becomes my first and foremost commitment. But I tell them, I am not doing it for you as a human being, but I am doing this to you for your nation. You have to go and fight for your country. You have to go fight for your country, and if you have to fight for your country, you have to have certain discipline. And you have to not only come with me, come to me saying that I am such a big intelligent person, I am an intellectual, and I am a researcher, I want to do, I have a PhD. A PhD, anybody can. But not nation, not everybody can fight. So you have to have an idol, and you have to have this idol. Then this print was declining in the 2000, early 2000, and the children they were going into what they, what they call is that, and I want to become something. I want to achieve something. I want to do something else. And like you know, I'm more fascinated by the music of Bollywood. I'm more fascinated by the, uh, the Western uh, life system. But everything is fine. But you have a responsibility. You have, in the middle of your life is that there is something like, you know, like the spinal cord in our system. The middle of your system is that, that going back, going back is not physically just pushing you to go there actually. No one is saying, like it's not like in the Western countries where people say, like you know, if you are from another country, like uh, what you have, the, uh, one of the American presidential candidates, I, I, I recall his name, and who says, all the foreigners should leave, but for us, you are not a foreigner. But, in a sense as that, you have a nation. You have a nation, but this nation, because even in India, the security and the freedom of Tibet is very important for the safety and security of India. And like you know, uh, when, when I teach uh, geography and political geography to my students, I, when they say the map of India, then they, say, they show me China, then I keep typing them that this is a map which is not politically correct. We must show the occupied territory territories that have been occupied and the change that has happened before 62 and 60 later and 58 and 54 and with a very interesting conversation I had with uh, my son's school teacher. So my son uh, came to me one morning and he told me that like, you, know, you keep, uh, I mean, they have been coming with me uh, from their childhood to the Tibetan struggles and movements and many places they have always accompanied me and uh, they also, they fight for the Tibetan cause and one fight day he asked me, I had an argument with my teacher and uh, my teacher said that uh, India's neighboring countries and saying like Bangladesh, Pakistan, Bhutan, Nepal, China and Sri Lanka, Maldives that I told my teacher, Tibet is also my neighboring country my teacher told me that, like, you know, I don't understand any geography. But I told my teacher, I don't understand geography, but you don't understand history. <laughs> so, if you, you see this point, actually, like, you know, we, we don't understand, but when somebody says, you don't understand geography means, it's a very short-sighted statement. Geography can be changed. Landmarks can be changed. You look at Europe, for example, how many changes European continent has undergone and how many nations have come and how many nations have disappeared. So, it's very important for us, we keep reminding other people. Then we keep reminding ourselves that this map is wrong. This description of politics is wrong. And about taking away my own past, from my life. I mean, imagine if your past as Tibetan is taken away from you and your land is removed and something else is shown as, then you need to resist that. I'm not saying resisting is to just keep in arms or rebel or revolution. I'm saying 
that awareness, that consciousness, that sharing that consciousness, telling another friend from your classmate in your college in Indian school or Indian college. I always tell Tibetan students, please talk to your Indian students. Talk to your friends in the bench, in the class, say this math is wrong, this history narrative is wrong, this Chinese description of autonomous region is wrong, region is wrong, and even that description of the car is actually takes away many traditional parts of like Ando and other parts of Tibet and takes it away and it shows selectively regions as Thar region and it completely takes away the traditional areas of Tibet. Tibet landscape, landmass is among the top 10 in the world. Such a big land to disappear is not a joke. It's not a joke. So for us as refugee communities that like you, you have responsibility. Your, your, your whole thing is not simply to become like you know, uh, I, I get an opportunity to get educated, I get an opportunity to be employed, I get an opportunity to earn a livelihood, then I get an opportunity to make a living. Then that we die. What is the whole meaning of this whole life? What is the difference between and another person? What is the I mean in India also we are we are a free, politically free and independent nation. But we still have not had many different forms of freedom. Many different poverty and deprivation, caste oppression, social discrimination. Then all this. But then to acquire one set of level to go to another, it's a continuous process. We also have to remember the concept of freedom. It's not that we become like, you know, uh, lack, completely indifferent to the idea of the challenges of freedom. But to remember that refugee is not a, any kind of a negative word. I don't want you to think that refugee is a, it connotes to something a word that like you know we have to feel ashamed. Not at all. We don't have to feel ashamed. In this world we have to think what is a refugee. And like you know, if you about like you know, who's not, we have to find, but we have to ask ourselves. The circumstances of becoming a refugee with certain kind of deprivation. So the, with this deprivation is, is, a, is the, another important question. So there's the second factor that I am connecting with the, the 2004 and 5 performance of the CDSE schools, then the Hinsular workshop, and His Holiness Dalai Lama's, uh, what they call this, that, like, you know, the choice. Very, very clear choice he made. He pronounced a very clear choice. That in accepting the gift, in, a, in accepting kindness, that His Holiness Dalai Lama said, you are being very kind, but the kindness has to be qualified. I have to receive. I mean, like, you know, I have to receive and apply what you give me in a most meaningful way. So give me the thing that I can use it. I can use it for my nation, for my people. So like, you know, it is, I always feel that like, you know, in this country you find about people who beg for something, like, you know, arrows, food, they always say, thank you. But we must have an attitude. The giver also must say thank you. Because there must be a right person to receive what you need. If you don't, if you, otherwise it is throwing away. It is like throwing away, you give it to someone who cannot use it appropriately, it is throwing away. So we must be very respectful of both the giver and the receiver. And I feel about like, you know, the Tibetan education and the uniqueness of this education is that it should not be wasted. It should not be wasted, it should be applied. And then the application is that you find there is a there are many interesting revelations in this world. You must be inspired by those stories. And why this education? Education is important. I, I have I had the experience of working with the Burmese uh, refugee community. Then uh, I used to connect 
the body is coming to lead us and bring them to Dharamsala to meet the Tibetan community leaders and political leaders. For a long time I used to do this, bring them to Dharamsala and ask them to interact with the Tibetan leaders. And one thing happened, why I say you are you are blessed, but in all misfortune that there is a blessing we see. And uh, in the Burmese community, as we in India, from 1988, from 1988, if you consider virtually about like, you know, close to 20 years, they spent time in India, in uh, living in India as refugees. But one thing happened in the Burmese community, for this, when they came to India, uh, they, did, they did not send the children to schools. And virtually for about one generation of young men and women did not study at all. And complete human resources was the purpose, the human resources, human skill, and then the school education got lost in the Burmese community. Then we went to ask, to find out about that, you know, why is such a situation today and how can this be addressed? So we had this question before the Burmese community as a challenge. They gave me a very touching reason. And I told this reason to the Tibetan leadership, which is very politically very revealing. They said to me, uh, I asked them, how can you not send your children to school? Look at Tibetan community and how uh, committed towards the education and the identity and this thing. They said to me, sir, we want to tell you the difference in our approach to the political struggle. When we left Myanmar, Burma, in 1988, as part of the students' movement, our leaders went to different countries. Our, then the topmost leader got arrested and beaten. And uh, we thought, we'll get back tomorrow morning to Rabu and fight the battle. And literally, tomorrow morning we will go back to our country. And uh, therefore, we did not think of sending our children even for one year education. We thought within one year, we will go back to our country. This did not happen in case of Tibetan. I mean, like Tibetans, when they came into this country, but they came with the view, the leadership is that, we are going to be here for a long time. We are going to be here for a long time. It can be long and maybe quite long. And that, like you know, we did not say that we are, we did not say we are not, we are not going back. So we are going to be here, we said that we are going to be here for a long time. Then people decided education is very important. We have to invest in education. We have to invest in all these aspects of things. That's the fundamental difference. That's the fundamental difference in, as refugee communities, how different refugee communities see their own life and struggle. Like if you look at about the Tamil refugees from Sri Lanka, and their oppression is also very, very intense. And uh, war crimes and massive oppression, torture, like the, in uh, in prisons in China, and then about like, you know, in Lhasa, and you find about in the Tibetan areas, like, you know, how people are tortured. I, I, I have seen the torture, I have uh, seen the torture equipments against the monastery and the monks, and uh, more or less the same intensity prevails in, in Sri Lanka about the Tamil community. So what happened is that, when they come to pass by, they have a different idea. They are not into looking into India as uh, what they call as uh, going to be studying here. They look at India as a passage country. They look at India as a passage country, but they want to also fight back. They also want to fight for uh, their homeland, the Tamil homeland that they fight for. But in case of the Tibetan community, that we took to a very important, what they call, breathing time. We need, we need to take a deep breath. What happened to the Tibetans? Why did we lose our freedom? And how did the Chinese occupy this land? And the circumstances? Then how do we kind of fight back? 
In this whole fighting battle, sir, the, the devices of fighting this whole for independence, the method and means also has been decided, chosen as the non-violence. But how do we fight the Chinese by violence in the sense like, you know, by armed struggle, by organizing uh, the Tibetan army or Tibetan resistance by armed resistance? And these were seen as not so practical. Not so practical. And then there is chosen means is that political, non-violent, political, and then through the peaceful negotiations were the path chosen. So in this environment of non-violent resistance, non-violent resistance is not cowardice. I want you to know. But somebody, someone says, chooses to say that I will fight non-violent means that it's a strategic choice. It's a strategic choice under the circumstances. Most appropriate means of fighting the resistance. But there is a difference about if you believe non-violence is cowardice, but what would you describe about a person who does not remember the nation? Who does not think about this country? Who does not think about the land? So non-violence is definitely a pursuit in achieving, in securing the goal. I want to tell a, a source, a very a historical source in the history of uh, politics in the world of lost nations and nations recovered. If you see the map of the world, in the European map, you will find a country called Poland. Surrounded by, on its eastern side, by uh, a nation called Russia and uh, many entities on the eastern European countries. Then, you will see about the Poland on the other side is surrounded by Germany. And what happened to Poland in the, by 1756 or 1760 is that Three countries came around Poland, like literally took parts of Poland away from its territory. And like the Germans came, they said, okay, we need this part of Poland. They, they attacked Poland, took away that part. Poland was reduced. Then the others came and said, we need this part of the territory, they took away Poland. Poland could not resist. Then the Russians came on the other side, they took away the part of Poland and virtually everything of Poland disappeared. Just like the way, but like, you know, two, two cats and the monkey story of uh, two cats fighting over a small piece of bread. That, you know, how do we share this? Then what, like, you know, tear it into pieces and pieces and finally the whole bread disappears into the hands of the monkey. Here you have the Poland as a territory completely taken away by countries like Russia and Austria and Germany. This happened by 1790. Poland virtually disappeared from the map of the world. But Polish people dis did not disappear from the earth. You see the difference between, like today, Tibet is largely in the political map of the world, Tibet is, does not figure. That means Tibet is disappearing from the map of the world. When the Americans publish the official map, when the Indian government releases its public official map, when the other governments in the world release the power, the map of the world, map of their official map, Tibet does not figure. What does it mean? It means Tibet is disappearing from the map of the world. But you need to ask the question, are Tibetans disappearing from the earth? Tibetans are not disappearing from the earth. But Tibet is disappearing from the map. So something must be done. Did all nations have their place? But people have always been there. But these maps have been changed. Maps have been altered. Maps have been drawn, redrawn, and redrawn again. So what has it happened? Like you know, the Polish people kept their national struggle. Some the, part of them became the Russians, part of them became the German under the German territory, part of them became part of the Austrian territory, and then like you know, there was no Polish land, there was no Polish nation. And at this time, Polish people.
people were doing and they continuously struggle as people and as nation and as nationalism and through the struggle is that then they waited like this morning when you said if you struggle and if you know your goal and if you have patience and you will have the deliverance and it happens if you ask me about like you know how long should I wait but waiting without work is not waiting you have to work then there is no waiting you are working for it and they keep this nationalist trust they keep this nationalist search going on by 1919 when Germany was defeated in the first world war and when Austria was defeated in the first world war and what happens in this settlement in 1919 Treaty of Versailles is that they among the demands put to Germany is that Poland should become free so like where is Poland? Poland does not exist and if Polish people said ok we lost everything we don't have to think like Polish we don't have a nation like Poland and we are all lost if they believe that in 1750 or in 1775 they would not have had the nation in 1919 it's about 120 years later they kind of resurface as a nation and as people everything of Poland comes together that's a great it's not anything like I'm saying this as an inspiration story and in this world everything will come find its place back and everything will find you including in North America including in North America the indigenous people's lands indigenous people's lives have, have been taken away have been rooted away and they took away the American today what America is of the America of the people of European origin but the Native American children going into the university going into the colleges you know, if you go and talk to them, they take pride in talking about that I am a Native American. That I, I want to fight for my the rights of the Native American people. So when they enlarge this fight, then they create a better democratic environment in the society which thinks only of the, the white people, the Western whites, and then in terms of the European settlers, it does not think about the indigenous. How does the indigenous people are treated? You open a gambling place for them. You give them the forest rights and gambling rights. And will you give gambling rights to your own citizens? Like in Lhasa. Like in Lhasa, when today, what you find is that people are allowed to open what they call disco queue in Lhasa. And why? Because they feel you are completely kind of, do not want Tibetan society to live with them. Cultural life that the spiritual practices, then the traditional relationship with the religion. And like you know, NASA becomes a, a tourist center. And like you know, telling about like you know the uh, Tibetans, you can earn money, you can earn wealth being part of China. But then money and wealth is not the single most criteria. Like telling the native indigenous people in North America, in Canada, and in these parts of the world that you can open a gambling center, entertainment center in your forest, the land. That means you are completely destroying the tradition. <laughs> These people did not gamble throughout their lives. Did not open up a liquor business in their places. So what your government is doing throughout the world is that destroy, take away the land from indigenous people. Take away the the, their traditional rights related to associated with the land and displace them, make them like completely supporting like what they call is that dependent on the alms of the government programs. We do that in India also to the indigenous people, to the native people in, in central India, be it in Odisha, be it in Jharkhand, be it in the, where, what they call is the Toda Hills and the, the tribes and different indigenous communities. So like, you know, uh, the Timothian identity is that in this whole changing environment of the world, like, you know, we think about becoming modern. What is becoming modern for us is to leave something that, you know, 
and what we call modern is that to leave behind something. That is to become modern. But that is not becoming modern. Leaving behind something is that they you know, are leaving behind what they call is that for materialistic well-being. And you can go to any country in the world. I, I don't suggest that like, you know you should not go to America, you should not go to Europe, and you should not go to third country. You can go to any country in the world. But remember one, one fact is that you have to recover that one country that is given. So like, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It's like it's like a mother thinking that like, you know, it doesn't matter about like, you know, where my children are. The children are fine. And then about but you must be connected to that. You must have the connection. Like the poor people from Poland have the connection to different uh, one single most objective of the nation. Single most objective of like, you know, if, if they wanted about like, if they were not able to fight the Russians and Germans, but circumstances of like, you know, time is beautiful concept. I, if you ask me about like, you know, uh, I, one word I like in Hindi very much is that, like that word simply, is not simply a, fascinates me, but it completely kind of like, you know, yeah, beholds me. You you understand that word be, beholds is like it beholds me. Spellbound. That word is called what? Like it is such a beautiful word. It's such a beautiful word. I am kind of eternally grateful to this word. Every language has many uh, beautiful expressions. Like for me, in all the words that I have heard and listened and understood is that like, in different languages, in Hindi for instance, like you know, the word what is like Hachi's Bhakti Bhakti. Then there is a beautiful concept in Cape in, in the city of Cape Town. And uh, the city of Cape Town, if you go to the city of Cape Town is that like you know people say uh, wind brings everything. Because that city is virtually located on the cliff, on a mountain cliff, and then it is open to the Indian Ocean, open to the Atlantic. There's the one city facing, it's like this. This side is the Atlantic, this side is the Indian Ocean. That the city experiences the warm waters and the cold waters of two oceans. It's located like this. It's like virtually like a mountain cliff coming. People in the the city have a very beautiful expression. What is this beautiful expression? Is that and uh, wind brings everything: diseases, good fresh air, and fresh many good ideas. And also, wind takes away everything from here. That means about like you know, time brings wind is it's also a time. Time brings to you. And time takes away many things from us. But I certainly believe, believe the same time will bring Tibet into a reality as an independent nation. And there is no such truth in this world. And like, you know, people who have lost land and people who have lost freedom, people who have lost what they call identity, but it is all meant to be recovered. It is all meant to be recovered. And that what that time, that will, is the most important thing we must capture in our imagination. We must keep this hope, not simply a hope and a, it's like a prayer. Hope is a prayer. But to pray to God or to pray to the Supreme, we also have to do work. If you say that like, you know, it is enough to pray, you find in our examination at the time of examination system, or like when days you have examination, there are always more people in the temples in India. There are always more people in the shrines, there are more people in the churches. But why do you only do the examination that day, that they are morning, they go to God, they remember God in the morning, is that you need some help. And, but like, you know, but to do work every day, to remember God every day, is a much better way of being close to God and being close to your studies. But the best way to remember God is also 
do your work. God is with you. If you do your work every day, if you remember your, if you are conscious, if you remember your duties and responsibilities, God remembers you. And you don't have to unduly recall the God and remember the God. God, God guides you. God remembers you. I'm not a religious man, I want to tell you. When I say this, when I tell people about God, and people think I'm really, but I'm certainly an animal interface by, uh, by, uh, by the practice of the birth, I'm completely an interface. But that does not make about superstition. I've been greatly inspired by the teachers and the wisdom of His Holiness and by Lord Buddha. But at the same time, but you have to do your work. And so say that I pray to God to give freedom to me and my country is that. But prayer must be realized means you must work for it. And then working, but in, in, if you are very kind of like, you know, uh, there is no self-pity is needed. There is no self-pity is needed. And about like, the self-pity is that, what can I do? I'm a refuge. And there is no such thing as, what can you do that you are a refuge? If you are conscious, and if you remember, and if you are responsible, you can do many things. And there is a very beautiful saying about this holiness, about like uh, the dream, the hope of holiness coming to Lhasa and to There is a beautiful description in the Tibetan folklore is that which says that like, you know you will return like the rains that shower the, the praise of God in all the plains and the land of Tibet. And like that is the prayer that is associated with Dalai Lama. So certainly that kind of the rains, the time, the work, in all this is that our commitment our conviction and then our responsibility to take. This is the only thing that I ask for. And to be refugee is not to seek self pity. Is to, to to be more highly personified with dignity and to greater responsibilities and work with time. Learn to work with time. Learning to work with time is a craft. It's a craft of politics. You must learn to work like the way that uh, people in Cape Town say, wind brings everything, wind takes away everything. So see the changes that are happening in the world. See the changes that are happening in China. See the changes that are happening in Tibet. See the changes that are happening in India. And see where you can be placed in this change. How you can create more changes. We can change. And if you can change, see all this and play an active role somewhere part of this change, certainly the time will come. And like, I, as I say, this is not something a prophecy. And we are not promised. We, this is not a prophecy and say, Tibet will be free. But Tibet will have to be free. It's not will be free. You have to be free as a nation. But you have to work for it. That is about like, you know, if, when you are in, like, you know, 15 years old and 22, 25 or 30, if you don't believe that, and the nation is not. That is where the difference is that, like, you know, there is always people say, there was about like, uh, in, the, in 2009, after the war crime, huge war crimes, and during the mass genocide of the Tamils in Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan president spoke in the parliament after using extraordinary chemical weapons were used and then like you know lethal weapons were used, aircrafts were used against the own people whom you call as your own citizens, like they used cafe jets to bomb the Tamil civilians. And 300,000 people were kept in the open air prison and for a number of days without food, without a lot of torture, sexual abuses, women, many were extraordinary things happened, painful things happened at that time. So he spoke in the parliament. He said, 
We have won the war. We have, I repeat, this is a very remarkable statement. We have won the war. Now this war comes to an end. But we may have this people asking for separate nation for the next 20 years because there is a generation standing, sitting outside this country who, is, who will pass away. After this, the new generation will only remember this war, will not remember anything about the past. You, you understand about that message, it is a message for all the refugee communities in the world. But the pain of being a refugee, the pain of losing your home, the pain of losing your land, losing your, losing your country, losing your, uh, the land, the home, should not just be held by your parents. The pain of the parents should be shared by the, the dreams of the children. Only then you see that life is cycle. Otherwise life is not a There's no meaning. And like, you know, there are so many moving stories actually, like, you know, I can describe what the like, people how when they leave, come to leave the land made by, uh, from Tibet, how they cross, then one last time you turn around and look at the land. It is so powerful. Even when I say this, I'm so sad. So people have made such sacrifices. So after that, you cannot just say that like, you know, I am in good life, I am in good education, my life should be better, different. Your life should be better, your life should be different. You must have everything. There will be better blessings in life. I want you, I want to pray for that. But I want you to remember your responsibilities and go, flow with the time, come with the time, and change the times. And people will be there. Thank you very much.